Xi Jinping's 100th anniversary of the CCP speech, what was really being said? Hello, welcome to Dangerous Policy, a channel aimed at intelligent people wanting to discuss important issues facing life and society. My name is Chris Byrne, and by now I've had a chance to watch through in its entirety and read the transcript regularly of the major speech delivered by the, the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping, on the 100th anniversary of the party's founding. Uh, there was a lot of quotes being thrown about in the media, a lot about Taiwan, a lot about the wall of steel, uh, basically China's belligerent comments about you know, if there was any foreign interference, the reunification of Taiwan being a national priority and those sorts of things. Now, this is very important, but I also think it missed the overall narrative. It's, it's a speech that really does bear reflecting on. Before I go on, I just want to make a point about the Communist Party itself. China isn't a country in the way that the United States is or Australia or, or Great Britain. What it is is a ruling body and the what is essentially the subjects, which is the Han people. Uh, think of it as a, a pre-Westphalian society in, in Europe where people were not aligned to a nation as such, they were aligned to a monarch or a family or, or a dynasty. Well, in China, the Chinese Communist Party is the effective owner of the institutions of government. So the People's Liberation Army, for instance, isn't there to protect the Han people, although that is a consequence of their role. Its primary function is to serve the Communist Party, uh, just like the troops of a monarch aren't there to necessarily protect the people of France, they're there to do the king's bidding, okay? Uh, if we think of you know, medieval Europe. When they talk about the Communist Party, much of the narrative is that only the CCP is able to bring about the national rejuvenation of the Chinese people, i.e. that it's the Chinese Communist Party that has the mandate of heaven, which had previously been bequeathed to in various imperial dynasties, whether it was the Song, the Tong, the King, and so forth. So when the speech is about loyalty to the party, getting behind the party, supporting the party through the next generations, what they're really saying is only under the party's leadership can China re-emerge on the world stage from when it was super weak with the wake of the opium wars to realize its future destiny. And Xi Jinping talked about this very adeptly. He started his narrative around the Opium Wars where 11 steamships from Great Britain sailed up the Yangtze River, brought the entire imperial China to its knees to force opium on the population. It's something that the Chinese remember with great bitterness. Not so much that it was Britain, but the fact that China was so weak that such a thing could happen in the first place. And that only with the Chinese communist leadership could such a thing never happen again. That's the narrative that's being sold. And it is a very effective message. But the key thing is that there is a shift. There is a shift. So before this speech, the narrative was support the Chinese Communist Party for only we can bring you national prosperity, to lift you out of abject poverty, to bring hundreds of millions of people to the middle class. And that speech declared victory on that achievement. And it is a, it is a victory in the sense that, you know, fewer than 1% of the population of China uh, is living in po poverty in international standards. It, many parts of China, you know, Shang, Bang, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Tianjin, all these places now have middle-class standards of living, certainly equal to anywhere you would expect in the West, some, some places even better. Uh, and China as a nation state has become the second largest economy in the world, will overtake the United States very likely during the course of this decade in terms of GDP. 
and is well on the way to becoming a great power on the global stage. But they drew a line under that to say, yes, we are you know, emerging and, and we have become a middle income country and we will continue on that trajectory. But now is our moment of national strength. They're moving from a promise of delivering wealth to the people, which they've promised to continue to do. But the emphasis by Xi Jinping was now not on national wealth, but on national pride that you will, as a Chinese person, realize the true standing of China's place in the world and that no one will be able to disrespect us. What are the consequences of that? Well, during the, the, the speech, Xi Jinping said to very muted applause, uh, you know, China has never invaded another country. We will never invade another country. Shortly after, he said, but if anyone you know, tries to thwart our national rejuvenation. If anyone threatens our national interest, they will face a wall of steel. And the rupturous applause was earth shattering. What this means is that China as a nation has changed in terms of its culture towards being something that uh, demands expansion, demands uh, to, to be the number one on the world stage. No longer do they want to play second field to anyone, even the United States. And the Chinese Communist Party has promised to meet that objective, i.e. this is not something that the Chinese Communist Party is necessarily driving, although they are harnessing it for their own purposes. This is a desire and need of a rapidly growing um, strong nation in China where the people themselves realize the potential for their national strength and demand from their leaders the realization of that dream. In that sense, one would be foolish to think that if the Chinese Communist Party disappeared tomorrow, if, if the Chinese government became a multi-party democracy, that anything would change in terms of its foreign policy. The, 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 mood of the people of China is that they now want to be a global power. Now, what does that look like? Should we believe China when they say, um, uh, you know, we don't want to expand, we're not territorial, uh, we just, you know, peaceful rise, we just want to be respected as a great power? Well, well, no, this is, this is total nonsense. And it's not even necessarily a thing about China specifically. Uh, this is just the way great powers behave. And, and let me... Um, explain why. So in order for China to be a global power, to effectively replace the United States as the number one power in the world, to be a dominant kind of uh, player, if not an, in fact a hegemon, uh, what is required? Well, first of all, there can be no question of, of sovereignty, disunity within their own society. So Taiwan absolutely must be part of mainland and answerable to Beijing. And that the Chinese uh, Liberation Army, People's Liberation Army will be occupying the entirety of that island and this entire population working to Chinese purposes. Uh, the South China Sea over which China has publicly claimed dominion, which is an expansion of territory no matter how you look at it, uh, they must have absolute control. That means expelling foreign navies and foreign powers, including the United States, from operating with impunity in that region of the world. It means not having a foreign army on the peninsula or on your own border. That means the United States must be expelled from the Korean peninsula uh, and preferably from Japan as well. Now, beyond that, uh, two more things will happen. China will start to build overseas bases and, and alliances with other countries around the world, as, as all great powers do. So uh, let's say they make a, a alliance with Sri Lanka or with Venezuela or, or uh, Argentina, and they go, okay, well, we're going to build a military base to you know represent the interests of this alliance. And then they will seek to defend that military base. So they will put more and more troops in that place. So you'll all have those far-flung uh, territories, enclaves, etc., that they will claim a right to protect and therefore project power overseas. 
Then they might say, we believe in indigenous sovereignty, the Han people, the cradle of civilization around the Yangtze River. We are one of those civilizational powers. And it's in our value system that indigenous people should have sovereignty where they are. So the, the native people of Okinawa, perhaps they deserve to be separate from Japan and kick out the United States. The native people of Hawaii, should they have ever been annexed by the United States? The native peoples of Australia, should they have ever been colonized? These are questions that the Chinese government, in terms of asserting its global dominance, may say in order to pick a fight. This is what realizing potential actually means in the global system. As Attila the Hun once said, empires expand until someone is strong enough to stop them. And that is just what all countries do. So China may say that they'll never invade another country, but they can easily invade another country if it's to defend a third party, if it's in the interests of a, an ideology that they propose, uh, they won't be seeing themselves as invaders, but as liberators, the same way the United States saw itself as it moved into Iraq in 2003. Uh, and then there is the actual hypocrisy of what the Chinese government say. You know, they have taken over Xinjiang, they have taken over Tibet, they are reincorporating Hong Kong. So, uh, you know, they may frame things as defensive, but, but that's not the reality uh, any more than we should be very happy that North Korea is called the Democratic People's Republic. It's not democratic and it's not a republic. Just to, I would really encourage you to go listen to that speech in its entirety because there is a strong pivot being pushed through that thread, a shift from national development, economic growth, to national strength and pride and rejuvenation of its sovereignty. The only way to interpret that is as a more aggressive foreign policy, a more uh, demanding foreign policy, and in some ways dropping a pretense in its foreign policy. The, the Chinese, just in the last few days, have uh, come out publicly and acknowledged that the tariffs that they've been imposing on Australia have not been because of you know, dumping of, of wine in large volumes or because of poor quality or because of biosecurity issues. It's because they feel that Australia has been offensive to China in, for example, seeking to find the origins of the pandemic, supporting international efforts in terms of human rights abuses, uh, criticizing China on Hong Kong. Uh, well, China is turning around public and saying, look, we are no longer trading with countries that do not you know, respect our sovereignty and our interests. Uh, this is a really bizarre kind of philosophy that I think will backfire them on them strategically. People will look at what's happened to Australia and question whether they want that to happen to them. Those countries that are not yet dependent on China's economy will have to think carefully about whether they want to develop a dependent trade relationship. But for many other countries, they'll just follow the bags of cash. And, uh, and particularly those countries that don't feel like there's any strategic interest in, in going against China, say, you know, a few countries in Western Europe, for example, don't feel like their territory is in any way under threat. Or if they did end up having a, a punitive economic relationship with China, that they would find markets elsewhere. Uh, but this is very much the, the attitude that China is taking. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, I think that we are accelerating the time frame for conflict. Uh, and, you know, China's victory condition, China's, uh, you know, desire to be a global power has several intermediate steps for which, you know, the reincorporation of Taiwan is just, is just one. Do not believe for a second that if China just takes over Taiwan, maybe you know, militarizes a few islands in the South China Sea, the China will stop there. Remember Attila's dictum, empires expand until someone is strong enough to stop them. Uh, that's my view, that's my review of, of Xi Jinping's speech. I'll leave a link down below to, for you to go check it out yourself. It is long uh, and can be a bit dry in parts. These are not you know, fantastic public speakers, but do um, check it out if you wanna get the flavor of what I'm talking about. You will see the shift between a peaceful rise economic development doctrine to a national pride rejuvenation doctrine, what that means in terms of foreign policy uh, and the new era in East-West relations we have now entered into. Uh, thank you very much for 
listening to this and I will see you next time. Goodbye.